Now we will move on to Martin Caicedo from Colombia, who will be presenting Trends in Language Assessment, a View for Practitioners. Mr. Martin Caicedo holds a master's degree in English language teaching for self-directed learning from Universidad de La Sabana, a graduate diploma in TESOL from Anaheim University, and a specialization in educational management from the, Univer from the Universidad San Buenaventura. He currently works as regional assessment specialist for Oxford University Press in Latin America, as well as adjunct professor at the Master of English Didactics at Universidad de Caldas. So without further ado, let us welcome Mr. Martin Caicedo. Hello everyone, good morning, and thank you so much for the invitation. I want to extend a very warm thanks to Romy, to all the team at Network this opportunity to, again, have the chance to talk to you, to talk about some topics regarding not only assessment, but also language learning and the latest trends that have to do with technology and how we can improve our job as teachers outside the classroom and, of course, in the classroom. Okay, so first of all, I wanted to check if I can share my presentation, but that I can also share the audio for my presentation. So I will appreciate if somebody from the team could uh, check if uh, it's working fine. Hold on, it's coming up. All right, so we are very proud to be participating in this space today. So I'm just going to start with a short video for you know, who we are. Not in lying underpin the progress we make as individuals and as a society. When we know more, we can solve new problems and explore fresh possibilities. For hundreds of years, Oxford University Press has been committed to sharing the best in human thinking. From a child reading their very first research of the to inspire data and understand. As content crowds every screen, ideas anywhere, they need to be seen. So Oxford University Press is changing too. Whether we're making learning work for anyone, anywhere, anytime, connecting a global community of English language learners, or helping influential ideas achieve greatest impact, we will meet the needs of education and research in new ways, with new ideas for new audiences. For as long as the world keeps making progress, we will always be advancing knowledge and learning. Oxford University Press, advancing knowledge. All right, so let's get down to business. The name of the presentation is Trends in Language Assessment, a view for practitioners. Now, when I was putting together the presentation, I was thinking about how we can talk about assessment and just disjointed from teaching and learning per se. And uh, with all these new trends that are coming and going, and we started to see how a new trend is coming in, and not only to assessment for, but to a whole uh, landscape of teaching and learning. And this is definitely AI. And AI is just uh, a storm wave that has entered to every single aspect of our lives, whether we like whether we like it or not, whether we know it or not. So I thought this could be a good space to just share some thoughts around AI and specifically how we can use those tools for us as teachers, how we can make these tools work for us, how we can make uh, that so that these tools, these new knowledge, these new different apps and applications and software can help us make our lives easier, but also a better and more 
impact onto our students. And uh, talking about AI, I'm going to start from the very beginning and understanding what is it. Now, of course, I'm not expecting that in this short time, and even though I'm not an expert in the field, but at least we need to know what it is. We need to know what it encompasses, what is it, what it brings AI, and how it works, at least at the surface, so we can understand how much of help they can be for us. So, what is AI? At its simplest form, artificial intelligence is a field which combines computer science and robust data sets to enable problem solving. And here I want to emphasize on this part first, robust data sets. And it means millions and billions and trillions of information that are being comprised on a single space. And this single space that is taking over in different applications is what is called, and I'm sure you've heard of it before, large language models. And how do they work? Well, a large language model is just an algorithm that can recognize, summarize, translate, predict, and generate tests and other forms of content-based knowledge gained from massive data sets. And what is coming on from publishers, from different uh, companies, technological companies, is that they are using this vast amount of information that we have available uh, through many years of internet coming in, producing this information to come in, build these data sets. And we can see these large language models in different applications, such so as, for example, chat gpt and we're going to get into that in a moment but first we need to see how is it how it works what is the large language model how does it work well it's very basic or well, this is a very basic explanation and of course it's oversimplified because how it works is that we have a prompt we have a question we have an order we have a command that we enter we input into a large language model. And what it does is to process that information and give an output in the form of test, in the form of code, and in form of automation. So when we're talking about large language model, the big advantage is that it's able to communicate in a human-like form, is capable of sustaining a conversation, is capable of working in a way as we were having a natural conversation with a human. Of course, it is not perfect, and we're going to talk about that in a moment as well. But we know that these has, these language models have so much power inside it that allows us to ask them questions and ask them to give us solutions, and they will do it based on those data sets that have been collected throughout the years. For us to have a better understanding of the size of a data set is I, here we have different models of large language models. We have GPT, which is the basis for chat GPT, which I'm pretty sure that you have explored them and explored it and use it. But we have some other data sets available, which is the Pile, Chinchilla, uh, Lambda, we have Stability, Rep, and look at the one that is in the far right. So when you see here, for example, if we take a look at GPT-3 data set, we have 499 billion token, tokens. And roughly a token is something around a word or 0 0.7 a word in terms of binary. So GPT-3, which is the access we have now when we go to chat GPT, which is the this version, has availability and process information in the size of 499 billion words. So all these words are collected in a data set. And what, for example, ChatGPT or any other large language model does is to analyze it and through an algorithm give an answer to our questions in such a way that it uh, predicts what is it, what we are saying, what is it, what is expected. But I want us to move 
to the right and see what GPT-4 is coming in. And GPT-4 is being uh, now included into some Microsoft applications such as Bing. And they have 20 trillion tokens. It means over 20 trillion words that have been collected. So every time we ask, let's say ChatGPT, a question, what the what ChatGPT does is go to this data set and start searching for and predicting the words that are, make sense so that it can answer to our questions or solve our problems. This is a massive leap into technology and a massive leap into the future. And I'm pretty sure that you've heard about this before. And I'm pretty sure that some of you have already made some experiments on how to use it in your classes. But this is going bigger and bigger and bigger and it's not gonna stop. And it's not gonna stop. So the better thing for us is to have an understanding of how it works, at least the basic understanding of how to apply it into our context and take and get the most out of it. And uh, ChatGPT and GPT is not the only one. We have different large language models available. GPT, as you can see here, GPT-3 and GPT-4 are the most important ones, are the ones that we are more familiar with, the ones that have more exposure to the media. But we also have Palm 2, which is Google. We have Cloud. We have Falcon, which is an open source. It means that it's for free. We can actually get and use it for your own experiments. And we have Meta AI, which is called Yama, Lama, that is a Facebook's, well, Facebook's parent company, which is Meta. So we, now we have, we might be familiar with ChatGPT, but we have more language, a large language models that will be available for us. So we need to have an understanding that there are more options for us to choose from. Now, for us that are familiar with this reference, with this reference, we've also heard about the the dangers, the hazards, and the risks of artificial intelligence. And we've heard from experts that have put out a word of caution that it could actually destroy humanity that we have to be careful, that we have to put some sort of pause or break into the development around artificial intelligence. And uh, uh, of course, if you've, if you've watched Terminator, you know what this reference is talking about, but this is just inevitable. It's here and it's here to stay and it's not gonna go anywhere. So we might as well, we might as well learn it, the, the upsides, the downsides, the benefits, the risks, but overall as a teachers, our understanding of having artificial intelligence on our side, because regardless of these words of caution of experts, people change minds. And I wanna go to Mr. Elon Musk that early this year was talking about to pause any developments around uh, artificial intelligence because it could destroy humanity. And coming from a person in his position, in his position that is really in the forefront of technology, you might think that this might have some sort of certainty or veracity behind it. But also, as I said, things change. And now Mr. Musk is also putting together funders and financial investment to create their own company in order to compete against open AI. Funny thing is that Elon Musk was one of the earlier, earliest investors on OpenAI, which is the company that created ChatGPT. And he just has some misunderstanding with the team and he decided to leave. And now apparently he is regretting his decisions. So let's talk about chat GPTs, open eyes chat GPT. As you can see, the name itself, chat GPT, is composed by two parts. GPT is the large language model on which the chat is being founded on. 
Now we are in the version 4.0. The first version that was uh, released worldwide started in November 2021 and was version 3. It went through 3.5 and now we are in 4.0. And the second part of the name is chat because that's precisely the interface that is using this large language model. It's a text-based conversation or a text-based language model. There are other language models that work on a different basis or different media or channel of communication. For example, there is one that is called DAL-E, D-A-L-L hyphen E, just a reminiscence of the word Salvador Dali. And what it does is also open eyes, uh, open eyes uh, product. And what it does is that it creates images. So you tell them what you want to see, you tell them what you want it to design, and it does, and it does. So we have different options. We have different uh, uh, alternatives to go into modeling and into using artificial intelligence. So ChatGPT, is the use or the interaction with a large language model through a chat interface. And as a definition, ChatGPT is a natural language processing tool. And this is key because for the ones who have used it, you see that when engaging in a conversation with ChatGPT, you have this feeling that you are actually having an interaction and exchange with a person or a person whose words, written words, make sense. They are not only grammatically correct, but also they are in a context that makes sense. Of course, ChatGPT is not the first one. If you think about your cell phones and you think about it, you have an iPhone, uh, a Siri, or you have uh, uh, Alexa, the Amazon Alexa, or if you have Google, the Hey Google, the, the help, those are also a different interface of artificial intelligence, though the way how the information is, process, is being processed is different. So what these assistants do is to go and solve the web, extract information. They are just translating our request into words and searching the web, surfing the web based on what we're asking them and giving us just plain information that we are requesting from it. Whereas with ChatGPT, what it does is to establish a natural language conversation. It's of course a tool that is driven by AI technology to sustain human-like conversations, but this is key. It can answer questions and assist you with tasks. And sometimes we thought that we might take different positions when we talk about these tools, whether we rely on them heavily or we just dismiss them entirely. And we need to find our middle ground and understand and see and try and experiment how we can use these tools to make our lives easier. Because ChatGPT is an assistant to answer your questions and assist you with tasks. So it's not a replacement, it's not going to replace you or anybody as a teacher as of now. We don't know what's gonna happen in the future, but it's not a replacement. So this is one of the stances that we can take. Sometimes we rely so hard, so much on a tool that we believe it entirely and see whatever they say. But ChatGPT, is a replacement, it's not perfect. It will give you wrong answer. It can give you wrong answers. You need to be on the lookout to check, to verify. It needs supervision. It needs for you to be on top of your request, on top of the answers, revising, checking. You can use it as a brainstorming body. So for example, if as a teacher, you are thinking about activities to implement in your classroom, and maybe you have this writers slash teacher block and you don't know what to do, or you are thinking about a specific reading unit for your class in a different context, and you don't know when to find where to find it. Well, ChatGPT can assist you with that. It can give you ideas. It can maybe they are the right ideas, maybe they are not. 
but it can give you ideas so that you can start opening your mind and searching and looking for different ways. And it can help you, it can help you with repetitive tasks. And this is also related to ChatGPT or AI being our assistant. Again, it's not that they're gonna do everything for, for, uh, for us, it's not that they're gonna replace us, it's gonna help us. We have different types of tasks that we do as teachers, especially in the planning part, in which we need to do one thing over and over and over again. And in this specific situation, in these specific scenarios is where we can take advantage of a tool, an AI-driven tool such as ChatGPT. But also, always have a word of caution, okay? And this is a Russian proverb that says, trust but verify. Trust but verify. So, yeah, well, great. We have ChatGPT. It's giving us tools, it's giving us ideas, it's doing things for us, but always check always revise. Why? Because how does ChatGPT or any other large language model work? Well, what it does is that it predicts. So you ask him a question, you ask him to do something, and what it does is through deep learning algorithms, they predict what the first word of the answer should be. And based on that, it predicts the next word and the next word in a context. But remember that these large language models are fed by us. And uh, when I say us, I say us as a humanity, as a collective. So we might encounter situations in which the answers that we receive are just uh, racist, are just uh, um, not social sensitive, or maybe insulting, or just make plainly no sense. So we need to be, again, in the, look, in the lookout to see what the type of answer that ChatGPT or any other large language model for this matter is giving us. And I'm going to concentrate this talk on ChatGPT because it's the one that we have more, let's say, the more access to right now. So always trust but verify, trust, but always check, corroborate, verify, what is the output that ChatGPT is giving you? Because it could be super smart, but also it could be incredibly stupid. This is a real question that was asked to ChatGPT. And this is a real answer given by ChatGPT. As you can see, the answer is just, Incoherent, it makes no sense. It's taking just prediction and it's predicting cotton versus iron and it's looking at the word heavier. So this is a type of relationship that the ChatGPT is doing. Heavier, iron, cotton. Put them together and predict, okay? So heavier means volume, density, which is more dense. So automatically they come to the conclusion that cotton, uh, the, uh, a cu iron is typically heavier than cotton. So the answer is 10 kilograms of iron is heavier. So these type of things are normal. And these type of things will improve in time, I'm sure, because the large language model is also being trained with thousands of tokens, billions of tokens, trillions of tokens at, at a time. The algorithms are improving. They're being more sophisticated. They're being more advanced. So they will improve. But there are many other aspects that we need to be uh, searching and investigating and checking. Because, again, it could be racist. It could be socially insensitive. It could come with jokes that are not appropriate for the ages of the person. So we always have to read. We always have to check. Now, how does it work? Quite simple, on six steps, we use a prompt to question ChatGPT. They use deal, uh, uses deep learning, analyzes the prompt, generates a response based on keywords and phrases they understand and gives the answer, access the database, and remember the database is all the words that it has collected 
our ears and from websites, from Wikipedia, and from many other websites and applications that serve as a crawl to gather information from the web. Then a step five, ChatGPT uses natural language. This is the key. Natural language is the one that ChatGPT is using to generate a response that both is grammatically correct and contextually relevant. So if we're talking about food, we make sure that the conversation is not only grammatically correct about, about food, but also that it makes sense to what we are asking. And step six, the output, the conversation. And we can sustain a conversation. It's not individual pieces of requests and individual pieces of answers. We can actually have a long conversation with ChatGPT. Now, what can we do with ChatGPT? What can the teachers do with ChatGPT? How we can make the most out of it? Well, first of all, let's see five key points to bear in mind when using ChatGPT, all right? So first, the prompt is the most important. The prompt is the most important. How you ask the question, how you prompt ChatGPT to give you an, an answer or to generate an output is, is the, the way you do it, the quality of the prompt is what, what defines the quality of the output. So you have to follow a very clear pattern, a very clear request, because ChatGPT answers to whatever you're asking them for. Yeah. And another thing is that we've seen many examples in which we are very courteous with ChatGPT. We are very polite with ChatGPT. And we say, please, yes. Uh, apologize, we do it, and we ask them for a favor, and if the prompt is not right, we excuse ourselves. It's maybe our tendency, but ChatGPT doesn't really understand it. They only understand command. You can do it, but it makes no difference whether you ask them politely or you just give them a command, all right? Secondly, is that ChatGPT remembers when you open a chat on ChatGPT and you start a conversation, all the conversation, the input, your prompt, input and output, input and output, input and output, is being remembered by ChatGPT. So you can go back to a previous input, bring it on, and continue a conversation based on that. So that way it's not a set of isolated conversations that you're having with the tool, but you have actually a thread that follows one by one, and it will help you to work around your task. Output needs to be revised. Always, please, always check the output. Always check the answer. Uh, trust, but verify. It can't solve the web. It can't solve the web. And this is important. So you might be asking it to check uh, what happened, uh, use the information on the website. It won't be able to do that. All the large language model information, the data sets have been already collected and they are in a database. It's not like a Google or a Bing that they go check and collect and extract the information. It's just based on whatever they have collected over the years. And on that matter, all the information that ChatGPT currently has available for users just goes until up until November 2021. So you can ask him anything regarding facts, regarding uh, issues that have happened before November 2020. But if you ask him anything that is after that, it will tell you that, uh, sorry, I'm sorry, but my database only goes until November 2021. So that is important if we work with different types of context or scenarios that are time frame. All right, so now let's see some examples. The first is, it's just an example. And again, this is not a final prescription. This is not the final solution. These are sort of just ideas for you to start developing in case that you haven't started yet. And if you haven't, you can just share with us, maybe later in the, in the Q Q a section, how you're using ChatGPT for your classes, for planning your classes, for assessment, etc. So I'm just gonna give four examples. 
The first one is that I can use ChatGPT for activities that uh, have vocabulary, reading, listening, and context, in context. Choose a specific context-oriented great vocabulary, write definitions, create a reading passage, and then the assessment part. And again, this is just uh, uh, arbitrarily selected by me. You can use any other combination that you want. And let me just get out the presentation for a minute, and let's see how does this look. Let's just put it full here. This is the sex. This is the activity that I mentioned. So how did I start this? In ChatGPT, we have different patterns for output, different patterns. And these patterns are the way how we ask the question, how we prompt ChatGPT to work around to give us an answer. So this first and a very common pattern is ask GPT to act at somebody to serve as somebody. So I start, uh, ChatGPT act as an expert in English language teaching. I want, I want to teach it and I've heard some, I have some typos. And this is to show you that even though we have typos, ChatGPT understands and it knows that there are some typos, but it understands the whole content, which is the most important. I want to teach my A2 level students according to the common opinion frameworks, vocabulary related to traveling. And I asked ChatGPT, choose 20 traveling related high frequency words that my students can learn. So I'm being very specific on what is it what I want ChatGPT to do. I wanted to do this, this, and that. And it answers certainly here are 20 high frequency vocabulary words related to traveling that are suitable for A2 level students. Why this? Because I'm thinking that I have to have a lesson plan on. Um, traveling and uh, any vocabulary, but I'm just blocked. I don't know what to do. So I want to integrate and I want, I don't want to go online and search for the words and I start being very specific where this works, it doesn't work. So I asked GPT to do that for me. So the, it gives me these 20 words and gives me an explanation. I can ask them, I could have asked them, look, I don't need any explanation and they would just limit itself to the 20 words. Then, and this is the part that I tell you that it remembers. So I'm following a conversation and it remembers the whole conversation that we have had. Based on the previous answer, I'm going to provide you with a template for your next output. This is another pattern, which is called a template pattern. And in this pattern, I'm asking ChatGPT that whenever I put the word word, it gives me a definition. Word is the word from the previous list and the definition is its meaning. The definition should be in Spanish. And look at this. Take a look at what happened here. Write an example in English next to a definition using the word in context. So ChatGPT does it and it starts. Sure, here is the template you requested. So the word, I ask word and definition, word, definition, and then an example. Why did uh, ChatGPT did this? Because I asked to give me the answer in a specific template template pattern is called. The first pattern is called the uh, persona, persona pattern, and this is called a template pattern. So it's giving me the, the definitions, yeah, in Spanish, and it's using them in context, right? Now, I keep asking it. I keep asking it for things. Now, using the word list you generated, read a passage of no more than 180 words in which the words are used, in these words are used. Bear in mind that the passage should contain at least 80% of high frequency words and only 20% of low frequency words. And this is an example, when you see the generation, the output that ChatGPT generates, that we need to trust but verify. So, yes, it gives me the, the 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 text with the indications. I checked it, makes sense, all right? I could have checked it against a corpora, but I'm gonna trust, trust on my experience so as a teacher, as my knowledge of the language, that yeah, it makes sense, yeah? Now I ask, which are the low frequency words you selected for the previous test? I wanna know which are the words that are low frequency that the ChatGPT created. And he says, uh, apology for the confusion, Upon reviewing the passage, I did not include any low frequency words. But look what it does. So he asked me, 
Do you want me to? Do you want me to add him? I say yes. And then look what it comes up with. Now it went all to the other side of the spectrum because you can see the words that are very, very low frequency words that we know for a fact that no students at an A2 level will be able to answer. So this is one example in which we need to check. We need to verify that uh, what is the output that our ChatGPT is creating. And then I say, well, well I'm sorry, but this test, it, this text is not going to be understood by the students. Rewrite it in high frequency words so that it fits for A2 level students. And then it does it, it rewrites it very well. It makes sense. And then I say, I'm an, I'm an English language teacher and you are my assistant. I'm telling them what is its role. I'm telling them what is it, what it is to do. With extensive expertise in test design, you are my assistant and you have experience. Out of the previous excerpt, create five questions about the, you say, I escaped the word questions, but it understands. To check a student's understanding, the subskill to be evaluated uh, through those five questions in guessing meaning is guessing meaning from the context. Certainly, here are five comprehension questions to assess a student's ability to guess the meaning of words from the context based on the previous passage. So as you can see, it creates the question and yes, is using the skill that I'm asking for. What does it mean and gives me answer? What does it mean and gives me answer? And we know that in any test, in any language assessment skill, we need to define the sub skill that we're trying to evaluate. And in this case is guessing meaning from the context. And then I tell them, please give me the correct answers, certainly. And here are the answers. And as you can see, this is a conversation that I just had with ChatGPT. And this is the output. And I had to check it. But overall, it could be a great brainstorming slash assistant body to create a task that I can use in my classes for A2 students. All right. So this is the first one let's take a look at the second one the second one says this is a writing production grading a writing production so what i do is i give the criteria to chat gpt first based students production and ask gpt to give feedback how did i do that well i went to my task right here and this is what i did Again, this is not the single recipe. You can use any other different tags. I think that you have to experiment and bear in mind that even though if you ask the same thing to ChatGPT several times, it will give you different answers every time because the prediction is based on the analysis of the data that they have. So in this case, I'm giving, oh, again, I'm using the persona pattern. Act as an expert in English as a foreign language teacher. Yes, at least teaching. The following is a rubric to assess students' writing production. I tell them that in this case, I'm going to assess the writing, my student writing, based on voc vocabulary. But I can use any or I can use grammar accuracy, uh, uh, lexical coverage, etc. So I give it the vocabulary, descriptor one, and I tell them what the descriptor is. And if the students' writing meet uh, this, a specific descriptor, it means 20 points. I give them another different descriptor and the points. Descriptor three and the point, etc. And then every time you finish grading a paper, ask me to send the next one. Why? Because if not, they're going to start sending information, sending information without me asking them first. So I tell them, look, every time you finish, sorry for the typo again, grading a paper, ask me to send the next one. So he has to wait for my input to come along, right? They say, sure, please send me the first paper and I'll assess it based uh, on uh, the rubric you provided. This is my students writing and it grades it. So he said, look, it meets the scriptor number two and it corresponds to 15 points. 
and tells me, please send me the next paper for assessment. This is the second paper that I send them. And then it gives me, the descriptor gives me an explanation as well and gives me the points. Then, then I'm gonna have this one, which is very simple, and it tells me descriptor three. And it makes sense. Look at the writing here. And descriptor three is doesn't use sufficient vocabulary. Vocabulary is below the expected level and often irrelevant to the topic. So as you can see, ChatGPT is making a very pretty good guess on the uh, grade that this student must have and gives me the explanation why, you see? And then I send that one that is very high level and gives me the scripter one, which is the highest one. And then I ask them, please, you are going to present a report for all the papers graded, use the following information. I'm giving them a template, right? In which name and grade. I give the name of the student, paper two, who corresponds to, name of the student, and the grade is the points the paper obtained. And use the following template, and it does use it, you see? And gives me an explanation of each. So it's giving me feedback that could be for the student. And I ask them first, then give me the average grade for all the students. It gives me this mathematical, and then once again, we need to revise the output. We need to be very clear, very specific what, what we are asking ChatGPT to do. And it tells me this, and I said, well, you know what? I don't need that. Regenerate the previous answer by just providing the answer. That's it. The average grade for all the students is 15 points. So we have this repetitive task, repetitive task of grading. ChatGPT can help us to optimize our time by doing this. Of course, we need to check, but it will save us time. Basic is the quality of the input the prompt. We need to be very clear, very specific. We can use as many descriptors, as many aspects as we want, but we do need to be very clear and very specific. All right. And this is the final one, which I'm just going to, I want to show you is this one here. Give feedback on speaking. So how do we do that? Yes. If you have your student to record, to record, and then we have free software that transforms the speech, the spoken speech to a text. Well, you can take this text that is now written text and paste it into ChatGPT. If you, go to, if you go to Word, Word has this option of dictate. Word has this option and you dictate. So you can ask your student to go to Word, give a production, make a production, a production, a speaking production, send it to you. Now it's in text. Now you put you paste it on ChatGPT and you ask him to give feedback. Let's see how it works. In this case, this is an exercise that uh, has to do. I, I'm going to show you an excerpt of a speaking production of a student. First, identify the errors in the spoken text. You see, this is the text. How was it produced? The student sat down in front of Word, opened it or activated the dictation mode. He said this, it came out of a text, sent it to me, I put it on ChatGPT and I asked it to identify the errors. And ChatGPT does it. It is the excerpt to the end, identify errors and tell me there is redundancy, tense consistency, and gives me all, of, all the errors. But you know what? I want to give this feedback to my student and it has to be in Spanish. So I asked him, please now give the feedback in Spanish. And it does, but again, we need to revise. I was not very clear with my prompt because if I had been clear with my prompt, this hadn't come up. You see, what they do is to, to translate it, everything. And I didn't want that. But again, I just say, okay, there is an error. I want something different. And I told them, make, make a comparison between both tests. First, write the exact test as the student produces. Third, list the errors in English, but the explanation of the error in Spanish. Do not use Spanish anywhere else. And then it tells me, 
gives me the original test. It's still, again, it translated it. It will, oh, oh, again, it was a translation. I didn't ask for that. We need to check. We, need, we needed to refine our prompt. But it gives me the list of errors as I wanted to with explanation should be corrected and giving me an option. Yes, and gives me general comments. And as you can see, we have different options for us to use ChatGPT as a way to make our lives easier. All right. Now, so when using ChatGPT support your teaching, please bear in mind, remember ChatGPT is your assistant and intern, it needs supervision. The quality of your output depends on the quality of your prompt or your input. ChatGPT can't solve the web, and its knowledge is limited to anything happening before November 2021. Combining ChatGPT with other tools, such as the dictation, the dictation option or our, our feature on Word, can expand your teaching. ChatGPT can be useful as someone to throw ideas to your brainstorming body. ChatGPT remembers you can program and teach it. You see, you program it when you give him order, you give him a context, you give him a rubric, you give him the instructions. And you can simultaneously use different languages in ChatGPT chat. You can use Spanish, you can use English, just you have to be very clear in the input part how it's gonna be presented. And of course, please experiment, collaborate and share. And sharing and, and the community of teachers sharing experience will be basic to do this. Right? And now that we're talking about assessment, have you heard about one of the most innovative international English language certificates? Well, I want to present you the Oxford Test of English before we close our session today, which is the uh, only certification that has been endorsed and certified by the best university in the world, the University of Oxford. I want to actually leave you with a couple of videos for you to have a context of what the Oxford Test of English is, and of course, some information on how to access it. The Oxford Test of English. I like the fact that I have to learn like a collaboration with so much that I don't have. to deal with this at B2 level of English. I feel a little bit scared because it was the first time that I took an English language test, but the Oxford test of English was great. I completed all the models in one day, so I felt so relaxed. The reason I like to learn English is because it's the business language, so I could use it for work or for traveling. So that's what I get. I, I get better job opportunities. Uh, Test of English, international certification that is available in Costa Rica for you, for your students to access to a tool that is going to open the world, the world's doors to better chances in studying abroad, studying in the country, working, and of course, immersing themselves into the, the English language teaching and learning and communication. And of course, we also have a version that is specifically designed for students between 12 and 16 years old, which is the Oxford Test of English for Schools. Let's see a short video on it. My students uh, are really happy because now with the new Oxford Test of English to become even more tailored because it is going to give us the opportunity to test those students who are younger. I like the fact that everywhere it makes me able to go to other countries and, and travel. You can relate with. Uh, that was uh, different from the things that we have had before. 
And now we have it with the Oxford Test of English. The test, uh, the advantage is that it to actually know the interests of the students. So we are asking some questions about job and economic questions that sometimes they are quite difficult for us. It will be helpful in the future when I go to the university. In the future, I would like to, to be a doctor. I would like to be a teacher, if I could. I want to study engineer. To go Oxford Test of English certification for young learners, for teens, and we also have very proud to have our Centro Idiomas of UNED as our approved test center. So if you are interested in the test, in taking it uh, for you, for your students, please do not hesitate to get in contact with the Centro Idiomas. I am leaving the information on the slide also the link with more information on the test so that you can have this option to give your students and yourselves the opportunity to access better opportunities in academic work and social environment. All right, this is all for me. I made it on time. Thank you so very much. And uh, if you have any question, please let me know. in language assessment, a very interesting and important topic for sure. I know that at least from some of the uses that you showed us today, I hadn't uh, pre previously thought of those. Um, we will now open the floor for a 10 minute question and answer session. Uh, I am sure that all the teachers here have questions about the use of AI or specifically JAT GPT from the perspective of an educator. We actually do have a couple of comments here. Um, some people are saying that they have actually used it to create reading exercises and that it's totally necessary to verify what the, the chat GPT gives you. Um, I do have a comment and question from Angie. She says, definitely useful tool if we know how to use it properly. Regarding the checking of speaking production, how accurate would it be? How accurate would the transcription be, scription be from audio to its written form? Yes, yeah, a very good question. And I've tested different program, different software, uh, uh, Speech Dragon, words, uh, uh, words, feature for dictation, and it's very close. But I came across to one that is called Natural. Pitch. I think that's the name I recall at this moment, that what it does is it fixes the student's production. And this is not what I wanted. So, for example, if the student would say, I have 10 years old, it would understand it and we will translate it, in, 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 put it into written test into I am 10 years old. But I wanted exactly the opposite. I want to see the errors so I can give feedback exactly on the points that a student needs to have feedback on so that it is pretty accurate. It's pretty accurate. And uh, I would say that things have advanced a lot. And I would say that it's between the 80, 90%, it'll be higher to 95% of accuracy in terms of what the speech turning into the written test goes to. Again, you have to try it out and try different options, of course. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. No, not yet. I'm sorry. That, yeah. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, I can. Okay, great. Um, we do have a second question from Angie. Let me pull it up here. Um, she says, what other apps, tools, or software are there for changing the oral production to written form? since not all PCs uh, working with Windows or Office offer the option to transcribe voice to text. 
I'm going to actually, if you allow me, there are many. I've tested some. If you want, I'm I have to I'm gonna reshare my presentation, and I'm gonna add some links to it because I don't recall them by 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 heart, but I I have bookmarked them. I'm gonna look for them and send it over to you, or I can send it over to the organization committee so that you can have like a little database of different tools. But there are many. I haven't tested them all, of course, but the five or six that I've used have been very useful for me. So please, uh, I'm going to make sure to share the sure. link with you. Yeah, that would be great if you could send them to us and we can share with them with those who are participating Absolutely. today. Thank you. Um, I do have another question here from Claire. She asks, is there a tool that teachers can use to detect if students have used AI in, in certain, I'm assuming that she's talking about work in which we don't want them to use it. Yeah, plagiarism, which is one of the main concerns when it comes to using AI. Well, yes, there are there are a couple that have been. Uh, I think that was a month ago, two months ago, that have been having a lot of uh, exposition exposition to to the educational world in terms that you can pay the students. For example, you ask the students to come up with an essay. And uh, you take an essay and put it in this software, and it can tell you if it has been created through an AI tool. It doesn't tell you which one. It, yes, there are. Also, I'm going to put it with the different uh, the links that I'm going to share. However, I do warn my fellow teachers, my, my colleagues, a word of caution in terms of how are you going to implement or have your students use ChatGPT outside the classroom. This presentation, I when I was putting it together, I thought about that. How can students use it? But it gets complicated in terms that it requires a little bit of uh, training on our side if they're going to work it on their own. I can use it in classroom environments in which I have an overseeing. I can have a con not control, but I can supervise them and provide some sort of support. But uh, this was more focused on how it can help us as teachers into our task, our planning, because it gets more complicated. However, there are applications that have been trying to check if a student's production have been some sort of created or manipulated or altered through AI. I'm going to also put it on the on the links. OK, great. Um, and our last question is from Isaac. Has this tool been explored to create rubrics, readings, or writing activities with students with special needs? Yes, a matter of fact, yes. And there is a little, a uh, uh, very interesting uh, research that came up uh, three months ago on how to use AI, ChatGPT, for students with special needs or learning needs. So, and in this sense, it says that you can ask GPT, ChatGPT, to create. Uh, excerpts readings for students with these specific disabilities. And this is important part. There is one example in which a teacher uh, created something for an ask GPT. Now you are a speech specialist, a speech pathologist specialist. And I have students with these conditions, these, these, these conditions, and they have been diagnosed with this uh, special needs or, or these uh, special or uh, different uh, different traits or a different person not the personality different feature different needs please create a reading text a ring or a text that has this number of words but that it fits the condition of this student that I'm putting uh, above ChatGPT does it and uh, this teacher his wife is a speech pathologist and they check it and she says yes it makes a lot of sense it really fits for a student with this type of uh, learning needs so yeah but the most important again is the prompt is how specific you are now if you have a colleague or a teacher or a person that I can prove read chat gpt uh, output better but yes you can do that and it has been tested
All right. Well, we thank you very much, Mr. Caicedo, for your insights on such an important topic and for your time today.